And here is Marlins left-handed pitching prospect, Dax Fulton. Dax, thank you so much for taking the time to come on, man. It was an awesome year from you. It was so fun to watch you just settle in, climb up, and then finish on an extremely strong note, which we'll talk about in double A. But first and foremost, congratulations on an awesome year. And thanks for coming on, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. So let's just talk about the season as a whole. We're going to get into some specifics and we're going to get into, you know, some of the things that you've worked towards and worked through since you were drafted out of high school and had to overcome Tommy John surgery and all those things. But how fun was this year for you, man? Cause it just really seemed like, and I know you're going to probably say you, you got more work to do, but it really seems like a lot of things clicked for you this year and you finished, you know, in what seemed like, the best version of yourself with the 13 strikeout performance in a postseason game at the double a level. You know, what, what did you really feel as the season went on? And uh, did you feel like something clicked to a degree? Uh, yeah. Um, and so I'll, I'll probably give you a different answer than you uh, were expecting, but uh, last year was a very frustrating year for me at the beginning. Really? Um, yeah, it was very frustrating uh, because I didn't start out spring training too hot. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't pitching very well. I wasn't, I wasn't happy with where I was. Um, just like on the mound, off the mound, just in general. I wasn't, I just really wasn't happy with how my body was and all that. And so it kind of took some time for me to just kind of say like, shut up, stop complaining and just kind of get after it. So I just kind of had to put down my head and work. And um, I'm happy that it was uh, able to show as I kind of went through the year, but it really, like, I feel like um, through uh, like right when all-star break happened was like kind of when I like tipped over and that's kind of when I started like doing a lot better. But the first half of the year was pretty frustrating for me because like, I would have like really good outings um, where I would strike out eight, nine, go like scoreless. Right. And then the fifth, sixth inning would roll around and I would give up four hits, three runs, two walks, and it would just like mess up my entire stat line. And so, um, and plus it wouldn't give my team a chance to win because it's, it's hard to score runs up and boy with the cold weather and everything. And um, so, yeah, that's the beginning of the year is pretty frustrating, but um, as the year went on, our, just kind of had to put my head down, start working hard. And um, I was happy with how I finished up. And hopefully, I mean, I, I feel great right now. And hopefully I can kind of pick back up where I left off. So what, what would you attribute some of that, you know, maybe fading in the in the later part of your outings to? I mean, this was an important note here is that you were still kind of building up your workload, right? Everyone has a different timeline coming off of Tommy John surgery. And you were a guy that was drafted out of high school. And then in 2021 through what, roughly 75, 80 innings. So was yeah. it just kind of building that workload up to go deeper into starts? Or was it more of just the, the comfort with the second, third time through the lineup? What, what did you feel like was causing you to, you know, have some of those frustrations towards the back half of starts I mean a lot of it was like you said growing pains like just learning how to pitch deeper into games uh but some of it kind of could do with just being in better shape like my fastball velo would fall off some and I mean I'm not one to admit uh, like I'm not afraid to admit it uh some of it was getting into better shape taking better care of my body and um I feel like when I really learned those things along with just getting more mature getting older um I slowly started to understand how it all worked um, a lot of it had to do with uh, understanding how to pitch to hitters and not showing all my stuff the first time through the lineup, maybe flashing it, but like understanding how to read a scouting report on each and every hitter. Uh, whereas I really felt like I started to learn that at the back half of the season, because at the beginning of the year, I was just kind of trying to throw everything up there and show everybody what I had instead of learning how to truly pitch. And, I, and last year was a really big year for me. Uh Yes, physically, yes, stat line was, but most importantly, mentally. It was a big mental year for me, and um, it's why I have the confidence I do now because, like, I had to learn all that, like, on my own. Like, I had coaches helping me, but, like, if you're unwilling to learn that stuff, it doesn't matter what the coach can tell you. You have to be wanting to learn and wanting to understand how those um, scouting reports work and how all that works and understanding your mechanics before anything else takes into play. And so that was last year was a really big year as just as far as like learning how to pitch. How much confidence did it give you that your stuff continued to stick uh, to tick up as the year went on too, right? Because I mean, you talk about learning how to pitch and locating and something that really stood out to me, especially in, at the end of the season was how much confidence you had in that breaking ball. You'd fall behind two, two and oh, and then snap one in for a strike. And we're going to break that down and the YouTube version of this interview, although th this will also be on YouTube, but the stream yard live breakdown that we do with, with these uh, awesome interviews. And I, I'm glad that you, you agreed to do it because I am so excited with uh, some of the at bats that I broke down from you this year that I was able to, to pick up that were just unfair uh some really disgusting at bats for hitters but how much confidence did it give you to 
see that uptick in fastball velocity, you know, more in the averaging 92, maybe through the first 10 starts or so by the back half of the season, you're averaging 94, 95, 96 on that fastball. Did that give you a little bit more confidence in the uptick across the entire arsenal to just be able to, to challenge hitters a bit more, or did you always have that? And it was more of the confidence in the mechanics and, and, you know, just consistency of locating and throwing strikes. Yeah. The thing is, is like, like I mentioned and kind of threw out earlier, the better my body was feeling, the better I took care of myself, the better I was going to be out on the mound, right? And so a lot of that came from, like, getting my lifts and getting my running and getting each everything, like, done. And it all started to play out on the field, right? Because, like, I knew that HUD always had it in me because if you go back and watch some, some starts, the first couple innings, my view was good. Everything was sharp. All my stuff was good, right? But then it would just kind of fall down, and I wasn't able to consistently have it. And that was even – like, even in 2021, if you go back and look at some of those starts, it was more of like a, okay, he's flashing that he can do good stuff, but it really wasn't all the way there. And so, yeah, it was a really good confidence booster for me, knowing that I could pitch into the fifth and sixth inning now and keep my stuff, hold my velo, keep making sure I can still execute my off-speed pitches and all that. So, I mean, it, it was – I mean, it was something that was learned, but like I, I felt like I knew I always had it in me. I just kind of had to get it out. Does that make sense? Yeah, of, of course. And what were some of those you know, physical adjustments? You talk about like taking ca better care of your body, obviously you yeah. know, adding strength and, and different things. But was there certain things in your workout routine that was a, a differentiator or maybe, you know, the way that you approach recovery or preparation? Like, what were some of the things that really made the difference on, on top of just the overarching taking care of your body? But were there one or two things in inside of that 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 really made that difference for you? Yeah, I mean, the, the two biggest things I could say are diet and finding a routine. So we play 120 something games a year, um, whereas the big leagues play like 160 or something like that. But we, we play quite a few games a year, right? And we're always at the field, we're always doing something. When I found my routine, it made it much more enjoyable, but it also made it to where I was way more consistent on the field as well. Because if I'm, if I'm struggling to figure out things to do throughout the week and I'm not taking care of my body in the weight room or in the like arm care department or in the food department, it's all going to show on the field. Like you got to like make sure you're on top of your stuff. And um, once I kind of figured that out, uh, I've always had some of a routine, but like last year, I really like I kind of like somewhat perfected it, you know, like what, what worked for me. Mm -hmm. And so that was really when I was like, okay, like I understand what I'm doing now. I've been doing it for some weeks and some months now, like things are starting to go well and I've seen success. So I didn't really want to change it. And so I would basically say like, I've also added some weight. Like uh, when I was drafted, I was drafted actually really light. Like I was, I was drafted at like, they said I was like 225. But when I got hurt my junior year, I was weighing like every bit of 185, 195. Like I was skinny. And right now I'm sitting right at like 240, 245. So I'm actually bigger than what some people say, which I'm sure y'all know, but um, that's, that's really like where my weight sits at. And a lot of that's just like understanding how to use that added weight and added muscle and make sure it plays on the mound as well. And if I get too heavy understanding, okay, we need to tone it down a bit. We need to make sure that we need to like my playing weight needs to be at this level. Right. Like, and so like, I kind of know what my playing weight is and what I do best when I'm at a certain weight. So going back to, you mentioned the injury. So you, you found out you, you had to undergo Tommy John surgery in your, your junior season. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how difficult did that make things? You know, you were committed to Oklahoma, you were ranked 18th uh, overall in, in your high school class by perfect game. Um, and, and obviously you were still going to have that draft interest and ultimately did get selected by the Marlins in the second round 40th overall, but how much, did that change maybe what you thought your whole draft versus college process may be? And uh, you know, how difficult was that decision? Because you're on the men from Tommy John surgery, you know, you're, you're trying to, and with, of course, something that has become a little bit more streamlined and uh, with, with a much better prognosis. And we see a lot of guys come back stronger, but at the same time, you're not pitching, you know, there's a little bit of unknown and now you got to decide where you're going to pitch when you are healthy, whether it's professionally or, you know, at Oklahoma, how hard was that decision and, and how much did the Tommy John surgery and the recovery impact that decision one way or another? So when I initially got hurt, I was like, okay, pro balls out the door. Like I didn't, I didn't understand how it worked. Like I, I knew like I wanted a high price tag coming out of high school because like, that's just what my parents told me. Like, don't settle, like make sure you get what you want. Right. And so um, going into the process, I had no idea. Like when I got hurt, I was like, 
yep, I'm going to college. Like, and I kind of accepted it at that point. And I was just like, you know, it is what it is, right? Like you just got to get better and go out and perform well a couple of years and then get drafted your junior year. Right. And so at first it was a little tough, but then as things started going on, um, more teams started knocking on my door, more people started reaching out. And I actually ended up having all 29 teams in my, in my house. Uh, the only one being Houston, of course. Um, uh, but uh, it kind of like fell into my lap. It was more of like a, yeah, we're still interested in you. Like we still think the world of you, like we, we, we really like what we've seen. Like, um, and then when COVID came out, honestly, COVID came out, no teams were able to really see other players because everybody was locked down. And so, some people at COVID might've hurt them, but in my opinion, I think COVID kind of helped me some because those scouts and those other teams weren't really able to go out and scout other players in the spring. That's interesting. And yeah. And so it actually, I, I truly believe that it ended up helping me get to pro ball uh, out of high school rather than college. Because I, I think that, um, I mean, I, I don't know if I, where I would be if COVID really didn't happen, you know, I mean, I, I, I could be still in college, you know, you know who knows. It's amazing the the butterfly effect of of each of these little things that can happen at some point in your career. And, you know, talking about which of those 29 teams you could have went to. And I think obviously with your talent and your work ethic, you'd be succeeding no matter where you went. But, you know, how much of just joining an organization here with the Miami Marlins set, you know, just has the the track record in recent history of developing arms. And uh, you, you look from top to bottom within the organization and and just see so much success on the pitching side. And you talked about some things that you had to figure out on your own. And, and that's what comes with professional baseball right but at the same time the the team and, and the organization that's guiding you can can definitely help in that department you know how much was it a help to have the marlins on the back half of that recovery and then also just continuing to grow as a pitcher in an organization that again has that track record and and has some similar you know guys maybe like a, a trevor rogers a tall lefty that really saw his stuff improve and got better and better as he got older and maybe a little bit different of a profile but a jesus lizardo that's a lefty with great stuff that has continued to get better and better obviously those guys came later but how much has it helped you just to be able to you know be part of an organization that just continues to develop pitchers whether they're like you or not i mean honestly they've done a great job i feel like they've done a great job with me um as far as like giving me ideas of what i would like to do like like they, they they're very like hands-on if you want them to be or hands-off if you don't want them to be right and for me they help me um as far as like the mental side they help me with my mechanics side um but they like we've we've talked about it and we figured it out like when things are going good they just kind of let me do my thing because like, and they'll tell me these little key things. And that's the thing uh, with Dave Island, which was my double A pitching coach. And then Jason Erickson, that was my high head coach. Those are the things like they understood that like, I wanted to learn as much as possible from them. Uh, but also I wanted to learn. So like I can tell myself that because I truly believe that like they can tell, like if a coach tells you one thing, that's fine, but you have to understand and comprehend what they're telling you, because if you don't do that, you can never be able to do it for yourself. And so that was always a big thing for me is like, like coaches telling me things and me like actually doing it and putting it into play rather than them telling me in it and then having to tell me over and over and over again. But no, they've done a great job. I feel like um, we've, we've really worked and perfected some of the things in my body. And um, as far as like pitching goes, I think they've done a great job with it. Uh, I accredit them very much. What has been some of the focuses with your arsenal? Because again, we talk about the fastball uh, and how that's just continued to tick up and your command of it is, is just continue to get better as you iron out your mechanics. And uh, you talk about obviously the curveball, which is, I mean, that's kind of your patented pitch, right? Even, even when you were drafted, I feel like that's what we were hearing about was, you know, Dax Fulton has this nasty curveball that, you know, you're going to really get to see. And, and even in the beginning, when you were still finding your footing, I feel like that was something that you'd flash every once in a while and people would be like, Oh, wow. That's that's going to be something that's going to be a weapon for him. But I think the changeup didn't get enough, uh, you know, attention because the changeup was I think further along than than people may have given you credit for last year. And then this past season, that was a big weapon for you. And we'll break it down again in the stream yard, which I'm excited about. And those that are listening for the first time, we have some video queued up, and we're going to kind of break down some of the nastiest and more, most unfortunate at bats for his opposition that I pulled. Uh, but you know, how much more confidence did you gain in the changeup? And was, was there any other you know adjustments to your arsenal as the year went on um there's like five questions i could build into this i'll save it the next one for a follow-up because i was about to ask you about the curveball because i saw some fluctuations in velocity sometimes it's hard
shorter um, with a little bit almost more of a, of a slider look to it. And then sometimes it's more of that bender curveball. I'm going to save that for part two. Part one is how did you get that confidence with the change up? And is that something that maybe didn't change much for you in terms of confidence? Or did you feel like you found a little bit more of a feel for it this year? Yeah, well, this year was, I think it was probably the biggest year I've had for developing my changeup, right? Uh, because out of high school, um, as you mentioned, I was a big fastball curveball guy and I didn't really uh, necessarily need a changeup out of high school, you know? You would have been doing them a favor, I think. Yeah. 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 yeah I mean, I do fastball curveball and that's really all I needed, right? Uh, but when I got to the, to the to pro ball, uh, my pitching corner, Scott uh, Aldridge, was like, yeah, like you need a changeup. And so, he showed me grips and we worked on different grips and then we found one that worked well for me. And I just literally played catch with it every single day for wow. as long as possible and just try to gain as much confidence as I could. I would play like long toss with it. Um, I mean, I, I still do a lot of things with my changeup just to kind of feel that because I, I truly believe that the changeup is like a feel pitch. Um, but yeah, no, um, kind of like how my season went last year at the beginning of the year, my changeup, uh, it was a really frustrating pitch for me because uh, I was learning how to throw it in the zone and get swings and misses in the zone. But also there was at times where I think that was the pitch that I gave up the most home runs on last year because I would leave it up over the plate and it would get hit out. And that was really frustrating for me as far as like a competitor standpoint, because I'm a big competitor. I hate losing. Like I, I want to do well. Right. And um, but as I as I learn more and more about the pitch and how to use it, um, I started to understand that like there's different ways to execute the change up. And uh, I truly think that it helped me quite a bit and, and definitely like being able to flash it was another thing that helped me. Like it might've not have been my bread and butter pitch. Like, whereas um, my curveball is right. Everybody talks about my curveball, but my change up was something I could flash and it's in the, it's going to be in the back of the hitter's minds. So like I could throw that and they're like, Oh, okay. He has that pitch. And so like I can use other things off of it. A hundred percent. And that's really all you got to do, right? Is just be able to flash that third pitch enough to where uh, they can't sit one way or another on. And, and even then, I mean, you, you talk about being a competitor, you could probably set a lot of good lineups down in the minor leagues with just the fastball and the curveball. But the change up is that, you know, X factor for you reaching your ceiling as that high end big league starter that, you know, you can be. So how hard is that? Because you're competing in a game that you want to win and your teammates want to win and you want to succeed. But at the same time, you, you got to develop and get better so that you can have that 15, 20 year big league career down the line and have that success and get there quicker. Uh, how hard is it to continue to trust that change up when, you know, you know, you could just go carve guys up fastball curveball when you do give up maybe that home run on the change. Like, do you ever have that voice in the back of your head? Like, man, I could just go to the fastball and curveball and, and, and maybe dice some of these guys up, or I got to keep trying to find uh, the change. Yeah. I mean, of course, but that's also comes back to like learning how to um, what's the word for it learning how to just like, like get better. What's, I don't know what the word is, but like just learning how to like get better and, and overcome like those growing pains, basically yeah. like, like learning. Okay. But like, I'm going to need that change up in the future and like, sure it might work now, but like, as I start continuing to face better and better uh, hitters, I'm going to have to be able to execute that third pitch whenever I want to. And especially if I want to be a big leader, that's just going to be part of my, um, what is that word? <laughs> um, I guess improvement. I, I don't know what it's called. Just part of your um, like progression through the minor yeah, leagues. Yeah, progression. Perfect. Yeah, it's just it's like that's going to be part of my progression is just learning that third pitch, right? And the more and more comfortable I get with it. Um, but yeah, like like I said, there's times where I'm just like, whatever, screw it. I'm just going to start throwing fastball curveball. But then at the same time, my coaches are like, hey, we need to still make sure we're getting changeups in. And um, it, it started working itself out. And I think that I, at the end of the year, I really found my changeup. And, and I think it made my, I really do think it made my fastball and my curveball. 100%. That 100%. And that's something too, again, like you look at Trevor Rogers, that, that changeup wasn't what it was for him for always, right? Like that, that was one of the best pitches in the big leagues when he had that rookie of the year runner up season, but he didn't have that changeup before. That was something that developed and you never know what ends up being that, that next pitch that might end up being your, your out pitch on certain days uh, when you can't find something else, but the curveball seemed to be there for you almost all year. And uh, there was almost two different versions of it. I saw from time to time. So I want to get, yeah. I want to get a little bit more on this because you know, you, you look at any scouting write up or whatever it's, they really just talk about the 80 mile an hour, you know, kind of bender. But I, I saw you mixing in some 85, 86, 87s that were a little bit sharper. Is that a manipulation of the curveball? Is that a, a slider? Like, what is what is the difference there? Uh, or is it just a pitch you're throwing a little bit harder? 
So yeah, a lot of it, I still both call, I still call them both curveballs, but they're, yeah, they're two different pitches basically. Um, and, and I do say that I have two different breaking balls because one, I kind of flip in there for a strike. Um, and it's, it is a little bit slower. It's in that 78, 80, 81 mile an hour range. And then the one that I am like throwing with obviously full intensity, trying to get strikeouts is the one that I normally throw with like two strikes or whatever. Now, I kind of started doing that the later I got into the year because I had noticed that like when I was able to land that curveball in for a strike, it was like, okay, they see it and then they're sitting back for it. And then I throw something that's five miles an hour harder and I get bad swings on it. And I'm like, hmm, that actually really works. And so I talked to my coaches about it and they're like, yeah, dude, that's great. Keep doing that. And so it was just kind of something I picked up over the year. Um, and kind of learned that I could actually throw that curveball slider um, at that 86, 87 range. And it was very effective for me. And so I just kind of continued doing it. That stood out to me as I was looking. And again, we're going to go over that because there was a couple of bats where I specifically picked that because, you know, it, it just was a totally different look. And if you're a lefty, it's just a nightmare if you're a left-handed hitter because you're trying to keep that front side on. You're trying to lay back on it. And then all of a sudden it's getting on you a little bit quicker or taking a little bit longer to get to you. With the fastball, is it just kind of one one variation or did you also mix in a little bit of, of a two-seamer in there as well? Or is it mostly just four seamer that, cause I know you like to elevate and you got a lot of swing and miss on that with the extension that you're able to generate. Yeah. So most of the time I stay true and throw four seam cause my four seam has a little bit of like a cut to it or as, as yeah. some would say. Um, but I have been working on like a two seam. Um, it's, I wouldn't necessarily say it's game ready, but it's kind of been something I've kept in the back pocket and I just kind of throw in bullpens and I'm trying to work on it uh, because I would like a pitch that goes into lefties yeah. um, that doesn't necessarily go away. Uh, but at the same time, my changeup's kind of proven that I can get lefties and righties out with my changeup. And so it's like not something I'm truly like needing right now. Like as like until I feel like it's something that I'm going to need, uh, I feel like the three pitches I have now, or I guess four, uh, the two breaking balls, the changeup and the fastball, they, I mean, I feel like they've been effective for me so far. So one of the last questions I'll ask you here before we jump to the live breakdowns is, what are your goals for, for 2023? Because, and I know that's a very open-ended question, but you know, you made so much progress last year. If you think about where you started versus where you finished, right? I mean, if you didn't have the year that you had, you, you could have had a pretty good year and been several steps behind of where you're at now, right? I feel like you, you jumped the timeline a lot. Uh, and at just 21 years old now, you have some double A success under your belt and, you know, with a strong start could easily be knocking on the door of triple A. And I think that's pretty remarkable, all things considered, coming off of, you know, no 2020, coming off of Tommy John surgery and, and just being a high school guy that that didn't have his senior year to throw as well. So, I mean, you've made up for lost time remarkably. Now you, you have that confidence. You finish strong. You, you talk about all the improvements that you made and the confidence that you gained as the year went on both on the mound and mentally, it, what, what's your focus and some of your goals for 2023? Um, I always tell myself that no matter where you're playing, you always have to like go out there and compete, right? Because obviously all the players in the minor leagues, big leagues, they all want to be able to control where they're going to end up, right? Like, obviously I'd love to get to AAA, get to the big leagues soon, right? But at the same time, I have no control over that. The only thing I can do is go out there and pitch as best as I can. So the one thing I always... Uh, that was my always my one goal for the year that I used to not take for granted that now or I used to take for granted is staying healthy. Like the thing for me is staying healthy, making all my starts. That's what's going to make me better. And that's going to what's going to make me propel and get to triple A and get to the big leagues. Right. Because the more they see me, the more I'm able to get out there and compete and the more I'm going to be able to uh, advance my minor league career the quicker it is I'm going to get to the big leagues. And so that's the one thing that I've always looked at is just staying healthy and just continuing to learn because I, I, I mean, you, I mean, I, I had a good year last year, but I truly believe I still have a lot to learn. Um, and, and I think that there's a lot of improvements I can make uh, before I get to the big leagues. And I want to make sure I'm more than ready uh, to pitch in the big leagues. That way I can stay in the big leagues, not just make my debut and uh, be up and down. Like I want to, when I get there, I want to be ready and I want to be staying there. Does that make sense? Of course. You don't want to look back. And, you know, I feel yeah. like that, You've got that straight line momentum now. And uh, what's one of the things that you could really point out maybe that you say you have some areas you want to improve. What's maybe number one on the pecking order there? Um, fastball command is probably the most consistent thing for me. Um, and, and I work on it and, and I, it's a daily thing that I work on. Um, it, it was something that I used to have um, in high school. Like I used to be really good with it. But for some reason, when I came, when I went through TJ, 
um, it was something that didn't come back to me as quick, right? Um, I was I kind of scattered the ball everywhere. I think I was focused so much on like throwing hard and making sure I got my velocity back that I didn't really focus on uh, command. But command's a big thing, you know? And um, so I think that's one thing that uh, if I had to pinpoint something, it would probably be like fastball command and learning how to execute just the entirety of the zone because I think that's something that I could continue to still like still strikes with uh, if I can locate that fastball because then if I can locate my fastball right then I can get ahead 01 02 and then use my breaking ball use mm-hmm. my changeup use all my stuff and that's how I think I'm going to pick up more strikeouts and stuff 100% last question is who do you kind of draw maybe some inspiration from it could be an old timer. It could be somebody that's still pitching now. Is there anybody specifically, or maybe a couple pitchers that y- you love to watch to just either just out of enjoyment or like maybe try to take a thing or two from here or there. So I wouldn't necessarily say there's anybody that I uh, mechanically like try to mentor myself, like, like do that way. Uh, but, but mentally, right. Um, Clayton Kershaw, he's a perfectionist. You can tell he's a perfectionist and yes, he's a great pitcher. Uh, probably going to be a Hall of Famer, right? And he, he's a great left-handed pitcher, but he could be right-handed and he could be five foot ten, and I would still love him because he's a competitor. He demands perfection from himself. You can always see the work he's putting in before the game, after the game, and um, he he just he just holds himself to a high standard, and that's really how I feel like I am. Is as I do hold myself to a high standard um, because I think that I'm capable of achieving basically whatever it is I need to achieve in the big leagues. And so that's the thing is, is like, it just, I don't know. I, I've always admired how he uh, handles his business. Oh, well, you both have uh, some pretty fun curveballs to watch too. And I, I know you say you don't emulate yourself there, but that, that wouldn't be a bad curveball to try to emulate. I, I don't think, but I think yours is, is pretty darn good itself. Uh, and I guess this will be the last one before we jump. What's one thing that you would love Marlins fans to know about you? Uh, maybe as a person, as a player, uh, because, you know, I, I think, especially on the prospect side, we just see some clips. We just see the the stats. We get excited. You know, Marlins fans are very, I know, very excited about what you've done. Uh, But I always like to add a little bit to to the person, right? So, you know, maybe what's one of your favorite things to do off the field and maybe one thing that that Marlins fans should know about Dax Fulton. Yeah, I mean, the one thing that I always, like that I would love to tell the fans is that I'm going to compete no matter what. Like I, I mentioned earlier that I am a competitor. Um, and there's going to be days that I go out there and I only have a fastball. I'm going to go out there and give it my best no matter what, because that's how I was raised. That's how I've been growing up. And that's how I'm going to continue to be is going out there and giving it my best and um, just going to compete like as hard as I can, because that's all I can do that day. That's my job. But more importantly, I get to play a game and I get paid for it. That's a pretty cool job to have. Um, Something that I do outside of the field, um, I do enjoy playing guitar. Um, that is something I'm not great at it, but it's kind of something I'm learning. Um, I enjoy playing pickleball. That's pretty fun. Uh, we actually just kind of picked that up. Some of the players and I, uh, on off days, we'll go play pickleball. Uh, it's a good, like a good little exercise. It is. It's a, yeah. it's a sneaky it's exercise, a, man. It's addicting, dude. My, my mom's like, all in. I don't like losing. I don't like losing. So like it, like the first time I played, I got my butt kicked and I'm like, Mm-mm, that ain't happening again. So I started getting better at it. <laughs> That's awesome. That one wears you out quick. I, I I was, my mom asked me to play. I'm like, ah, sure. I'll go play. And I'm, I'm playing against, you know, these 50 year old women and they're, they're working me. I was like, all right, I got, I got, <laughs> I, I got, I got to figure this thing out, but it, it that's a lot of fun, man. I love that. But guitar, I tried it. To, to me, trying to, to move the fingers is harder than a change up grip. So uh, <laughs> I, 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 I let the guitar go, but I think that's a great thing too. I mean, I, you know, my friend Griffin Kona and your teammate, like I know for him, his, the way he clears his head is, is making music on his computer. Yeah. And like, that's something oh, yeah. that, that gets him good, cleared. Dude, I've listened to some of them. He makes great music. He's good, man. He's good. Yeah. He might make the intro to one of our next podcasts at just baseball, uh, you know, cause he, nice. I promised him uh, we, we'd give him some run there, but you know, I, I love hearing what players do off the field. Cause it's just so essential, right? I mean, just to, just to have something to kind of just clear your head on. That's not baseball and uh guitar and pickleball sounds good to me, man, but <laughs> let's, let's break down some of those at bats that the link for this is in the description of the podcast for those listening. But if those that don't see the extra video, Dax, thank you so much for taking the time, man. And, and it was so fun talking to you really excited to see what you're going to do this upcoming season. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. It was a blast.